Hello and welcome to the Global Discussion, discussions with creatives, leaders and thinkers. My name is Simon Hodgkins and it is a real pleasure today to be joined by Amanda Cassidy. Amanda, you're very welcome to the podcast. Let's begin by asking you to introduce yourself to our worldwide audience. So over to you, Amanda. Thank you so much, Simon. It's so wonderful to be here. I'm thrilled to have been asked. Uh, My name is Amanda Cassidy and I am a journalist and crime writer Um, I've been working in journalism for about 18 years. I started television. I went on to work in radio. And now I'm I'm a multimedia journalist, but I do a lot of work for newspapers and magazines in Ireland and the UK. And uh, I think you've condensed an an awful lot in a very short statement there, Amanda, because you've been around some of the the most well-known publications, as you say, as a journalist, and as a commissioning editor, uh, and you're doing an, an awful lot. But uh, I also wanted to ask you a little bit about your uh, experience and career as an author, because it's very exciting at the moment, isn't it? Could you maybe share a little bit of that for us? Yeah, I'm one of those really annoying people who my whole life I said, I really want to write a book, I really want to write a book. And then it was really only during lockdown. And I think a lot of people were in a similar position during lockdown when it was just do or die moments. So um, it, it was it was in the middle of lockdown. We moved um, over to Spain for a few months when my husband was working. And I just knew there was no excuse anymore. So I locked myself away and I tried to write. Um, what would eventually become my debut novel, Breaking, which is it's a crime novel. It's um it's a psychological thriller, and um, it's very loosely based on the Madeline McCann story in that the kind of criticism of um, judgment of motherhood and the expectations on motherhood. Um, but shockingly, um, enough that it took off, and within two months, I had my agent, and within another three months, I had a two book deal. So it was definitely worth my while during lockdown. Um, but it was an interesting departure from writing fact, right, which I do as journalist all the time. And I think there's definitely that correlation between, because um, I'd worked for Sky News and I'd worked for, I did a straight crime breaking news live reporting. So um, I would be at a really awful crime scene reporting from it. And then I would just get into my car, drive home, and it's, it stays with you, doesn't it? And so I'd find myself wondering, saying, oh my God, can you imagine that happening to you? And then I thought, well, if I could control the ending, you know, if I had some semblance of um, being able to create my own world that I could control, um, it, it would be a lot more interesting. Um, it doesn't mean it would be a happier, happier ending, perhaps, but um, you would just be able to manipulate the wrong word, but you would be able to influence the story in a way that you could control, which uh, appealed to me greatly. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And obviously, when you're reporting on actual crimes, as you say, that can stay with you uh, for, for for a long time or forever in some cases. Um, and I wanted to ask you, though, about the process of writing. You're no stranger to the written word. You're no stranger to communicating through your journalistic endeavours. Um, but did you enjoy the process? Was it different being an author of, of your, your book? Uh, because... Some people, and when we talk to various authors here, they have very different styles. Some really struggle to squeeze out X amount of words per day. Some like to write in the morning, some late at night, night owls. What was that process like for you? And um, would you be changing anything as you now with this two book deal? Um, Have you learned anything along the way through that process? Because it is a little bit different from being a journalist, right? Being an author. Yeah, it's very different. And I think after being a television journalist and then a radio journalist, um, I think I found along the way that it, it was the sitting writing the scripts part that I was enjoying the most. I would have been quite a quiet person growing up. Um, I never really found my voice, so to speak. So to suddenly have people want to read what you're saying, it's um, it's a really wonderful thing. And it made me a bit more confident in my own voice as well, because as a journalist, you're reporting other people's stories. Um, so to become an author and write your own story, your own version, and people want to pick it up and they want to read it. And now I've just finished writing my third book and people still seem to want to do that. So for me, that's a real revelation that came up in my, 40, up in my early 40s. So that was quite a revelation. Um, but regarding the process, um, 
I mean, I think journalists make really good authors because we're very deadline driven. Um, and I think most of us have no compunction in saying, okay, don't like that, that's grand, swipe, let's get on with the next one. You know, where I, I hear a lot of uh, my other friends who might be journalists talking about, you know, their precious words and, you know, so I think um, I've been making money from words, writing words for a long time before I was a journalist. Um, it's just such a much more creative process. It just brings those creative juices alive that you don't, wouldn't get um, necessarily in journalism. I mean, I could see it creeping through in my journalism when I was writing. Um, I'd be writing, say, a human interest story and you'd be interviewing somebody about their experiences of, of maybe a, a bad illness or something. And you would be able to kind of draw on the person and their personal experiences and add that to the story to give a bit of theater for, for, for the people reading. Um, so so I, I could see myself doing that more and more in my work. And then um, when I sat down to write my own story, um, I found it so freeing to be able to just write the words I wanted. And they, they could never be wrong. That's another thing. They could never be wrong. I mean, people might like them very much, but they weren't wrong because they were my words. Um, I mean, it was, it was wrong grammar. Don't get me wrong. But <laughs> that's what we all live with. Um, and then Night Owl or Early Bird. Well, when I first started writing, creatively it was in the evenings during covid a lockdown when i'd have to homeschool the children during the day i have three young children homeschool them during the day do whatever else we needed to be doing and then between the six and eight every evening i would just retire to the bedroom sit on the bed and just on my laptop and write for two hours and it was utter bliss it's complete and i i didn't i was writing into the abyss because i didn't have an agent i didn't know where the story was going i had no um i had nobody telling me anything so it was therapy of sorts um, then, of course, writing the second book was um, a, a much more different process because there was ex expectations involved in that. And I was suddenly aware that there was readers going to be reading it. It wasn't just for me. Um, but I wrote that very quickly. I, in fact, I wrote the second book before my first book came out. So that was, again, quite freeing. I knew that if I didn't write it quickly, I might get self-conscious about you know, how I presented it. So I wrote that really quickly, and that's actually out um, next week, that book. Um, and then the third book was a completely different process again, um, in that I'll be going out in submission for hopefully um, trying to get a book deal for book three and four. Um, and that was very heavily involved with my agent, um, who would say, you know, I normally don't plan my words. I just write and feel, and I would be quite creative like that. But she uh, was encouraging me to plot and plan and, um, you know, come up with the different characters, what they might wear, all these things that I had done. I'd written very instinctively before that. And I found that a really different process. I can see how you want, you would have much less editing on the other side. Um, but I did miss the straight, um, just sit with the page and see where it takes you. Well, that's incredible because, um what you've shared what you've shared there is a very interesting um path i suppose and one thing that i wanted to ask you about is you mentioned your agent there a number of times and it's interesting isn't it the the benefit of an agent uh, for an author uh, really is something that a lot of people don't consider when they want to get into this book writing world but it 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 i suppose that relationship between the the agent, the editor, you know, the person with the red pen and also the publisher, that's kind of like a really important relationship. And I'm just interested in your thoughts on that and, and how that, that really helps an author from a, a leverage perspective. Yeah, it, it is really important to kind of trifecta of people, but without it, the book would never make it to the shelf as far as I'm concerned. I know a lot of people self-publish and I think that's wonderful and I'm all for that. In my case, I hadn't been, I hadn't been following the forums or you know the social media accounts where people are submitting to agents and having those awful knockbacks sometimes for years or having to shelve their manuscripts. I had come, come into it, maybe fortunately, I'd come into it quite oblivious to, to all of that. I knew, I knew it, somewhere in the recess of my mind that it was going to be hard to get an agent, but. I, I hadn't been part of that process. So I came in a little bit um, naive to it maybe. And then I got 
really lucky getting my agent quite quickly and, and getting book deal sales. So maybe I didn't have that same jadedness. Um, but that I had that wide-eyed experience going into it because it was also new to me. So I think that it kept me um, very enthusiastic and fresh about it and very grateful. And I think that I think that's probably the only change as you go on. Not that you will still be grateful, but that you will um, maybe hold a little bit more leverage or hopefully you'll be able to be a bit more assertive when you're coming to you know, some of the, the business side of it because you know I'm a creative I'm a writer. I don't not what would be a huge business person so um i think it's it's interesting again in the 40s to suddenly be um, involved in this industry where you don't really know much about and you have to learn really quickly on the job um but um my agent represents me in all the areas that i don't know how to represent myself um, when it comes to contracts and when it comes to negotiations and but that's wonderful. That's great. And um, I'd be lost without your anger when it comes to some of the editorial process. Um, it's very easy to get bombarded with everything that's going on and not really understand what they want from you. And and it's still your your work, so you're quite um, protective over it, I suppose. Um, and then publisher publishers um, that I'm in awe of publishers. I'm in awe of a how they make money, but I'm in awe of how um, how they take the book for pages that you've written and they elevate it to a level that's just really incredible that you even look at yourself and think, God, how did I do this? Um, so, you know, whether that be cover or an editor giving suggestions on certain themes you might um, bring out a little bit more, um, it's really, a, it's a quite a magical process. Um, uh, and I'm really enjoying it still. That's great. And Amanda, just one last thing on this, because I do want to move on and ask you some other uh, questions. But you mentioned earlier when you were sort of retiring to the bedroom and you were, you, you used the term, you know, almost writing into the abyss because you were just kind of getting it down. Um, if you could go back in time, would you do anything differently, fundamentally differently? No, I, I, I really never look back in my life. I never do because I think in that moment, and this this is for all aspects of my life, in that moment you, you've done the best you can with everything that's available to you. So I kind of look back and imagine that girl sitting on the bed writing during COVID with children shouting downstairs and and I think that that, that was really special in that moment and that's you know what led me to sit here with you today, for example. So I wouldn't have done anything differently. Um and writing into the abyss um, was really uh, special because I'll never get that again as like in the industry if you like. So those words are quite unadulterated um, when I first wrote them. Um, and my friend had said to me, who's also a crime writer, she had said to me, because I was saying, I want to write a book, I want to write a book. And she was like, listen, just go write a bad book because I was there flexing my fingers and thinking, what's the best team now? How do I open this? And she just said, just write, go write a bad book. And it's never going to make to the shelf anyway it's going to have a million iterations and it'll be very different so don't worry about writing something a bit you know not great yeah. and that was the best advice ever because um it just freed me up to be able to just write and then seeing other people's success in the industry people that i knew and um, other journalists other friends who, who had started writing books and even other creators who, who i would see you know artists or songwriters um doing um doing it and doing well from it that was really inspiring and I, and I love that. I love how other people inspired me. Well, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. And thank you so much indeed for sharing that. And I can't go on without mentioning the, the recognition, because for those that are in this genre, the Dagger Awards are very, very famous. They're, they're, they're very well known in this segment. And you've got a little bit of uh, awareness here, didn't you? Could you maybe tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I was completely blown away to, to find out that Breaking My First Book had been um, long-listed and subsequently shortlisted for the, the Dagger Awards, which is, um, somebody called it the Oscar Oscars of Crime Writing Awards, but I, I don't know if I would <laughs> push it that far. Um, but um, yeah, I was completely blown away, and next thing you know, I'm standing in a sparkly dress in the middle of London, um, drinking champagne and having a great time. So. I didn't win, but I still say the winning was being shortlisted because um, 
it's just so wonderful that no one could take that away from you, the fact that you got down to the final six out of thousands. So I was just thrilled that um, your first book to get recognized like that, it's a real incentive to keep going because, I mean, it's it's a lonely, it can be a lonely industry. It can be isolating at times when you're just sitting at your kitchen table or sitting on your bed writing. Um, so to have um, the, commun the community is really special in terms of going to Harrogate and other crime writing festivals, being asked to speak to panels, um, and then of course being um, being nominated for awards or shortlisted, um, it makes it so special. Yeah, well, congratulations. And it leads me nicely on to the other thing I wanted to ask you, which is about, do you take, obviously your, your career and your background and your expertise will feed into whether it's consciously or subconsciously that the writing that you do. Um, but has there been people or are there people that, that you admire that have inspired you in this area? Um, and, and if so, who, who would they be, or is it a particular style that you like? Um, you know, since I was about eight years old and I was asked to read my first essay at school in front of the class, um, by a nun, actually, Sister Magdalena, in my convent school that I went to. You know, as just an eight-year-old child, that was a huge deal for someone to say, you know, your work's good enough that, you know, we want you to read it out. And so, as I explained, I was a quiet, shy child. For, so for that to happen, like, filled me with such uh, such confidence in, in the ability to do something and do something well. And, and I, that's what I try to do to my children now, trying to find something they're good at and just celebrate it. And so it started by being inspired by people starting from that, that stage, you know, with teachers or with other mentors who just encourage you along the way. Um, and then there's, I've always been a huge fan of um, poets, especially Irish poets, um, Irish or writers, but, um, you know, especially Seamus Meaning, you know, I could, I could just sit and read his poetry all day long. Um, and it's just something about placing the words to create feelings for other people that's really, really quite magical. Um, and then there's there's other writers in the genre that I uh, have come quite close to. And of course, whether they even want to or not, they they inspire me or they spur me on to, to write better. And I think um, there's no better compliment than somebody reading your work and then, you know, wishing they've written it and wanting to write better. And I look at some of my friends in the industry uh, you know, other Irish crime writers like um, Catherine Ryan Howard, uh, Liz Legend, Andrea Mara, um, and then within the industry, Lisa Jewell, uh, and, you know, so many amazing crime writers. And I read their work and just, it makes me want to do better all the time. And now, luckily, unfortunately, I've been asked to be a, a judge for the Gold Dagger Awards. Um, and I'm getting sent so many wonderful books um, by amazing authors at probably might have picked up and I'm reading their work and again that's inspiring me so it's kind of a it's a lovely vicious circle of uh, inspiration going on and then my motivation like so motivation um for all of this uh, apart from personal fulfillment is um is my children being proud of me because I dedicated the first book to my 12 year old daughter when she was 11 um because you know I want you to see that if you work hard and you work well you'll, you'll do well in life um and my second book is for my son, my little child. And now my third book, I have to sell the third book, Simon, because I have a third daughter and she's looking at me. <laughs> um, and then my poor husband, he'll get the fourth one uh, when we go as well. Um, and after that, who knows? <laughs> you know, I, I love that, Amanda. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's wonderful. Um, so look, you're still busy as a journalist. And of course, you now have the, the, the authoring side to everything that you're doing. But when you look forward over the next six months, 12 months, 24 months, how do you go about planning now? Uh, what's the horizon look like? What's on your roadmap? It's an interesting um, question because um, in my journalism, everything is very snap decisions, quick. You know, when I worked at radio, it was 30 seconds to get a story on air sometimes. And and that's the type of person I am. I'm, I'm patient and I'm, um, I'm just go, go, go. But in publishing, it's extremely slow. It's, I can't describe how slow it is. It's so slow. The, the, you know, people go back and say, okay, you have three months to get those edits back. And I'd be like, you mean three days? Like three weeks? No, three months. 
Um, so there's a lot of waiting around now, which I think that must be the hardest thing about a journalist to a writer, um, a novel writer, is that adjustment. I have to, I had to change gears completely. I had to slow down. I had to use that time in a different way. Um, so planning ahead, I was initially like, oh, well, if I do a book a year and then I'll do this and maybe I'll write a kid's book on the side and, you know, I'll fit it all in because that's just how I am. Um, but I realized that you, you have to respect the industry and it's, it's that way for a reason. Um, so planning-wise, um, with my agent, we were going to go out with this book um, earlier. You know, I wanted to go earlier and try and see if we could um, submit book three and four. But she was like, slow down, take your time. So May came, June came, July like, was like, oh my God. And then nothing happens in August. So hopefully September, things will speed up a little bit. Um, but I would, my ambition is to to write a book a year, um, just to, to just have, a, just know each year where I am, when I'm at education page, and then live my life around that if I can, because at the moment it's just, I'm still getting established. I'm still that kind of stop start mode where um, you kind of just don't know what will happen in the next year or the next two years. Um, I want to keep, I want to remain in journalism. Um, I love it and I just imagine ever doing anything else. Um, but I just want to keep writing, you know, and write a lot. And I'd like to write a year, next 20 years if I can. Wonderful. And, uh, I think you know, given the the, the quality of the, the the journalism that you do, the publications that you're involved in, um, and also the the trajectory that you're on uh, with the books, I think a book a year would be absolutely wonderful. Um, and there'll be many dedications of many books, hopefully. <laughs> I need more friends to get dedicate all these books. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Um, so look, finally, uh, before we come to the end of our time together today, is there anything else you'd like to share with our worldwide audience? Something maybe we haven't mentioned or maybe something you want to reiterate? And secondly, and importantly, if people want to get a copy of the, the books, if people want to reach out and connect with you, where's the best place to send people to, Amanda? Yeah, so um, what I'd like to say is that my, my second book, The Return, is out um, this August. Um, so if you're interested in um, having a look out for that, uh, it's you should find it online very easily. Um, and I'm I you can find me on Amanda Cassidy writes. I'm on most of social media, uh, Instagram and LinkedIn, Twitter as Amanda Cassidy writes. Um, and I'm I'll bore you with updates about what's coming, how you can get my books, uh, and a little bit about my life as well. Um, I actually really enjoy doing social media. I know some. Uh, some creators find it a chore, but I, I really enjoy the meals and doing all that, um, and that part of it. Um, and then just to reiterate, um, somebody once asked me why I wrote, and there's so many reasons, there's so many answers to that question. But the thing that the overarching thing I kept coming back to is that I tell my students now if I'm teaching is to, to write to connect. And that's all we're doing. We're just all trying to um, bridge that invisible divide just to say I, I know what that might be like I know what your life might feel like to you and I feel that too and I think that's just the, the underlying theme that I would say to anyone aspiring writers or anyone struggling to write or um, anyone in, in anything they do is write to connect you know and, and that's hopefully something that I will continue to do as I go from strength to strength in my career. And what a wonderful and important note for us to end on today. So that brings us nicely uh, to the end of our discussion here on the Global Discussion Show. Thank you to Amanda. Thank you to everybody who's been watching or listening to us around the world. Make sure that you follow, like, subscribe, do everything I need you to do to help support the show. And of course, run out immediately and get your hands on the, the latest copy from Amanda and follow everything that she's doing. But listen, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I hope people can join me again for some more conversation with creatives, leaders and thinkers. But finally, thank you so much, Amanda. It's been wonderful to talk to you today on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.